Let's take a look at ways to enjoy the garden home from the outside in and the inside out. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design and ways to blur the lines between inside and outside. Now in today's show, we're gonna take a look at some ideas that'll help you achieve the concept of the garden home wherever you live. Ideas like planting roses that will not only bring beauty to your garden, but also to your home when you create flower arrangements with them. Ways to use fresh from the garden ingredients in the kitchen. And exploring ideas that take their inspiration from nature and looking for ways to use that idea inside in your decorating. Plus, we've got some great how-to projects that'll help you bring the garden indoors. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. When I'm looking for new ideas on decorating the inside of my home, I usually take a walk around my garden. I find so much inspiration in nature. Take colors and fabric choices, for instance. I've been keeping bees for many years now, and when I happen to cross this piece of golden fabric that has tiny bees sewn on it, well, I couldn't resist purchasing it because I knew I'd get a lot of use out of the material. My hobby of beekeeping has also inspired gifts from friends and family. One year, someone gave me these charming bee cups. Another person gave me this bee-shaped honey server. And of course, I love to harvest my honey and use it in the kitchen or give it as gifts. The harvest began by removing the supers from the hives. Now a super is just a shallow box that sits on the hive and it contains frames of honeycomb. The queen bee is excluded from the super. Only worker bees can enter to fill the comb with honey. I'm cutting the honeycomb from the frames. I think comb adds so much to a jar of honey. It's really fascinating how bees make beeswax. They actually take some of the honey they've made digest it and secrete it through a certain gland. It actually takes three to four pounds of honey to make one pound of beeswax. Let me explain just how industrious bees are. You see, I started with a foundation of beeswax and you can see the line here. It's a thin sheet of hexagonal shape stamped on each side. From here, the bees build out the comb on each side like this and this, and they fill each cell with honey and cap it off, as you can see, with a full frame. I just take a sharp knife and cut around the edges, lift off the frame, and then slice the honeycomb in pieces large enough to slide into a jar. Then I top it off with extra honey and put on the lid. Beeswax has many uses in the cosmetic, pharmaceutical, and dental industries. And of course, we've been using beeswax candles for centuries. The way I see it, all of this honey and beeswax is really a bonus. Their real value to us is how they efficiently pollinate all of our fruits and vegetables. Inevitably, when people discover that I keep bees, they always ask if it's a dangerous hobby. Well, sure, there are occasional stings, but for the most part, this ancient practice of beekeeping is relatively safe if you follow a few simple rules. But that's not to say there isn't the occasional bit of excitement. I'll never forget the day when my crew and I were taping in my garden, and then all of a sudden, well, here, let me show you. So often, the spring of the year can bring some of the most fantastic surprises we have an opportunity to see Mother Nature at her best. One of the most amazing phenomena for me is to see a swarm of honeybees leave the hive, and that's exactly what's happened here in my garden. A new queen bee has emerged from the hive and forced the old queen to leave along with part of the colony. Now the old queen in her hive must find a new location to live. Unfortunately, these bees cannot survive in the wild like they once could because of two different types of mites that have destroyed their numbers. One is an external mite that actually attaches itself to the bee's body, where the second is an internal mite that lives in the trachea of young bees. As I wait for the bees to settle, I really don't have to worry about being stung. You see, they're so preoccupied with protecting and staying with the queen bee, they hardly notice me. I'll need to try to collect this hive out of the tree as soon as possible, because scout bees are already out looking for a new location. 
You know, I do try to retrieve every swarming hive I can because without the aid of beekeepers, the mites have made it impossible for them to exist in the wild. If you find a swarming hive in your area, contact your local county extension service. Perhaps they can put you in contact with local beekeepers who can help save them. There are really two reasons I'm interested in keeping bees. First, as I mentioned earlier, they're tremendous pollinators and certainly help keep my garden fruitful. Now the second reason is for the honey. Now we're going to talk about using honey in just a moment, but first I want to show you an interesting way to use beeswax. Beeswax is used in many products, but candles are some of the most traditional. In fact, some churches require that candles used in certain ceremonies must contain at least 25% beeswax. Making candles from pure beeswax is really quite simple. All it takes is some sheet beeswax like this and wicks. You can purchase these supplies at some craft stores or from mail order beekeeping supply companies. Before I make candles, I just warm the wax in the sun until it softens a bit. Or you can lay it on a towel lined cookie sheet in a 250 degree oven. It just takes a couple of minutes for the wax to soften, so it's workable. Next, lay a piece of the wick slightly longer than the sheet and gently roll it, making sure the ends are even. Of course, the more sheets you roll, the thicker your candles will become. Use a utility knife to trim the excess and a warmed metal spatula to seal the edge. It's amazing how popular candles have become, particularly around the holiday season. And to think, the essential ingredient here is from our friend, the honeybee. All right, now that we've put beeswax to use, let's step into the kitchen and create a recipe using honey. Hey, it's just another way to bring the garden indoors. If you're looking for good value among the fresh produce, pound for pound, it's hard to beat carrots. They're a root crop that if kept in the crisper of your refrigerator can last for months. I have an easy recipe that can really enhance the flavor of fresh carrots because two of the ingredients are ginger and honey. To prepare this dish, I start with about one pound or eight medium sized carrots. I cut them into three inch pieces that are about a half inch wide like this. Then I take a fresh ginger root and cut off a two inch piece that I peel and thinly slice. Next, toast a half a teaspoon of cumin seed. Now you can do this by simply stirring them around in a hot skillet for about a minute, then remove them from the skillet. Over medium heat, melt half a stick of butter, or a substitute, and add the carrots and ginger to saute for three to four minutes. Now once this is done, add a couple of tablespoons of honey and continue to saute for another four minutes until the carrots are tender but firm. I'm always looking for ways to include honey in my cooking, and this recipe is certainly a great way to take advantage of this year's honey harvest. Now all that's left to finish this dish is to sprinkle the toasted cumin seed over the top and serve it warm. This is a great way to bring out the natural flavor of carrots, making them an ideal dish for any autumn meal. You can be sure if there's something I can harvest from my garden, I'm looking for ways to bring it indoors. It could be honey, like you saw with that honey gingered carrot recipe, or flowers, like roses. Did you know that on my 100 by 150 foot piece of property, I grow nearly 40 varieties of roses? And you can too, even in patio gardens or on balconies and terraces, because roses can be grown in containers. In fact, I've put together containers with roses climbing on trellises or used miniature roses in containers with great effects. Roses make wonderful cut flowers, especially hybrid teas. Now these are the long stemmed kind the florists like to use. So let's say you want to plant a rose in your garden. Where do you start? Well how about a garden center with selecting the rose plant? Roses come three different ways generally. Already grown in containers, wrapped in a loose material or a poly bag, or bare root through the mail. It's been my experience over the years that when it comes to buying roses, you get what you pay for. For example, with hybrid teas like this, you know, the plants that produce those beautiful long stem roses you find in the florist, they're graded three different ways. One, one and a half, and two, with ones being the best. Now the way I figure it, if I'm gonna spend the time to select, take home, plant, and raise a plant, I want it to be the best it can possibly be. 
A stronger, more vigorous plant stands a greater chance of rewarding me with more blooms over a longer period of time. Beyond grade, there are other things to look for. I always go for plants that have at least three strong canes, and I avoid any plants that have brown, shriveled, or damaged canes. And I always look for buds, brightly colored ones on the sides of the stems. This means the plant is alive and well, and will begin to grow at the first sign of a warm day. Once you've selected your roses, either through the garden center or from a mail order catalog, the next step is to get them into the ground. To grow roses successfully, you just have to start by placing the plants in the right place and following a few basic planting principles. Whenever I add roses to my garden that I've ordered through the mail, the first thing I do is remove them from the plastic and make sure that my order is complete. I'll soak these roots in water to rehydrate the plants, but for no more than 24 hours. When you're planting your roses, placing them properly in the garden is critical. You want to make sure that they get at least six hours of direct sunlight a day. You also want to make sure that you get plenty of good air circulation. You see, this will help cut down on fungal problems later in the season. As for the soil, you want a good rich garden loam that's well drained. To give my roses a boost, I always like to amend my existing garden soil. I take two parts of the existing soil to one part of my homemade compost and mix them with one part well-rotted manure in a wheelbarrow. The size of the hole needs to be at least large enough to spread all of the roots out and about 14 to 18 inches deep. These hybrid teas need to be about three to four feet apart. When I plant, I gently spread the roots and alternate the layers of soil mix with a solution of fish emulsion and water to give them a good start. Now once these little guys are nestled into their new home, in just a few months, you won't believe the results. And when those results look like this, who can resist cutting roses and bringing them indoors? I know I can't. That's half the fun of growing them. Now just as there are helpful hints for growing flowers, there are also tips we can use for keeping them around longer in the house. If you can work it into your schedule, it's always best to cut flowers in the early morning. You see, the stems and leaves are full of water at this time of day, and you want to cut them before the sun has been on them too long. When you begin to arrange the roses, here's a simple recipe to follow. Make a solution of lukewarm water to about the same amount of lemon-lime soda and a couple of teaspoons of bleach. The sugar in the soda actually serves as the food, and the citric acid helps the flour take up the food more efficiently. And the bleach, well, it just keeps the water clean. Now, you can get these little packets from the florist, which serve the same purpose, but this is just a simple homemade recipe that's always worked for me. Now, it may seem odd that one should have to feed their cut flowers, but it really works. A couple of years ago, I did an experiment. I put one bouquet of roses in a solution and the other in just plain water. Those put in the solution stayed beautiful for four to five days longer. You can actually use this recipe on flowers other than roses, such as tulips. It's no surprise that Holland is known around the world for its tulips. After all, they've been grown here for over 400 years. The Dutch are crazy about tulips, and the local florists never seem to tire of their beauty. They're constantly experimenting with new and creative ways to display them. Wilma Meisman has developed quite a reputation for herself as a progressive florist. She's been arranging flowers for over 12 years. Can you kind of describe to me what you're doing here? Yeah, I've uh, taken off all the foliage or all the leaves and I uh, bend them around in this face. So each flower holds the next one yeah, in, right. in place and you just sort of weave them together. Yeah, right. Now I noticed you were scraping the stem. Yeah. You're doing that for what reason? Uh, so you can see the, the lines through the face, through the glass, mm -hmm. and in this way uh, also the lines of the stems are very nice to see. And when I let the leaves on the stems, you can't see it this yes. through the face. So right. in this way it's better to take it off. So part side. of the design is being able to look through the vase and see all of those interesting shapes. Yes, right. It's beautiful. It's important to know for viewers that we only have used 15 stems in this vase. Then with only a few tulips you can do a lot. Ask any gardener what they enjoy the most about the spring, and they'll almost always tell you it's the beautiful flowers and the garden fresh vegetables. I'd say I'd have to agree. 
I think that vegetables can be as attractive as flowers. Just take a look at this butter crunch lettuce. Now while flowers may seem like an unlikely candidate for the vegetable garden, they do add their own touch or flavor, and I mean quite literally. These little violas don't taste too bad. Now, not everyone has this much space to grow vegetables and flowers together, but you can create the same effect by using edibles as ornamentals in a container. Let me show you. Last fall, I planted about 20 tulip bulbs in this container. Once they started to emerge in the early spring, I planted some parsley and two types of lettuce. I really like the combination of colors and textures this creates. You know, I love to mix vegetables and herbs along with flowers. It's an idea I picked up when I was a student in England studying garden design. That's why I recently created this bouquet using flowers inspired by my travels to England. This English garden bouquet contains old-fashioned snowball viburnum, delphinium, bells of Ireland, along with these beautiful salmon roses, which are accented by these delicate asters and another old-fashioned favorite, the lilac. I grew many of these plants in my garden, and I always enjoy putting together arrangements like this to give to my friends and family. Cut flowers are a great way to celebrate, and I think it's interesting that certain flowers and items from the garden have come to symbolize different seasons and holidays. For instance, if you celebrate Easter, then you may associate lilies with this time of year. If Kwanzaa is on your calendar, then you know about the bounty of the harvest. Halloween certainly wouldn't be the same without pumpkins. And what would Thanksgiving be without turkeys? Sorry, guys. But those who celebrate Christmas, you probably enjoy a Christmas tree or even a Yule log. You see, every family has its own traditions for the holidays, so many of which are actually rooted in ancient times. Yule logs are a great example of the elaborate legends and symbols associated with the holidays. This custom started in Europe, and the idea behind it was to burn a log at Christmas for good luck. You see, the longer the log burned, the better your luck would be in the new year. So if you were smart, you would choose a slow-burning hardwood, and the bigger, the greener the log, the better. Even today, we can get pretty fancy in decorating a Yule log with things from the garden that are also rich in symbolism, like this holly. The spiny points of these leaves were thought to represent Christ's crown of thorns and the berries, drops of blood. And like so much of the other greenery we use, the holly is also evergreen, symbolic of everlasting life. Mistletoe, another evergreen that can be used, we tend to associate with kissing, but the Romans believed it to be a symbol of peace. I'm even using an evergreen herb, rosemary. It's named for the Virgin Mary, and she's believed to be responsible for changing its flowers from white to blue. Every holiday we celebrate is marked by certain traditions, and certainly Easter is no exception. There are Easter eggs, baby chicks and ducklings, sunrise services, and of course lilies. It has been said that the white lily symbolizes purity, virtue, innocence, hope, and life, the spiritual essence of the season. And just like the traditional Easter lily, the passion flower also has a story that's fit to be told this time of year. As expert passion flower hybridizer Patrick Worley tells us, in this story about priests in a newly discovered America and their experiences with this plant. Many parts of the flower they, they felt represent the passion of Christ, the death of Christ on the cross. So the Jesuits gave it significance that way, the three parts here with the, the Holy Trinity. Also, they look like the nails. Uh, that were driven into the cross, the two hands and then the feet. The five parts here were the wounds and the, the corona represents the, uh, the crown of thorns. The um, tendrils were the scourges and the five parted leaves looked like the hands that were holding the scourges. And there's other symbols too that they, they saw and they felt that, felt that this was a symbol that they you know, belonged in the new world. And this is something that they sent back from the new world to the Pope.
Every time I come to a garden center or nursery in the spring, I'm always dazzled by all the beautiful flowers and varied colors. I find myself wanting to take home each one of them, but that's really not the best approach for a well-designed garden. To help me focus, I let color be my guide. A simple rule of thumb that I follow is to choose plants that either have blooms or foliage in the same color family, and there are lots of different color families. Just take the primary colors. Look at all of the variety just in the color red. And when it comes to blue, it can range from sky blue all the way up to purple. And among the yellows, you can go from chartreuse all the way to orange. Then there are the flowers that bloom white and the plants that have gray foliage. They're the amiable sort of relatives that get along with every color family. Color can evoke certain moods. Reds and oranges can make you feel hot, while pale blues and pale lavenders can evoke a restful, cool feeling. The other thing these hot and cool colors seem to do is play with our sense of space. You see hot reds jump forward and make a space seem smaller, whereas subtle colors like pale blue make a space feel much more expansive. Another thing to consider when putting color combinations together is the individual growing requirements for each plant. And you can get that information off the tags or through the nursery. But when it comes to color, it depends on your own personal taste. Oh yeah, one other thing, don't forget, Green is a color too. Color is an important aspect of the garden home, both inside and out. I know when I restored my house, I had to make some decisions about what colors I would use in each of the rooms. And it seems like it took months for me to make up my mind. Fortunately, when it comes to the garden, it doesn't take me quite as long. You see, each of my garden rooms has its own little color theme. You know, what's great about color schemes is that if you don't like what you put together one year, in the next season, you can change it all out and do something completely different. Now I've got a project for you that brings color into the garden home. It's an arrangement that will last for a long time. This arrangement involves house plants, and while the one I'm creating is ideal for fall, you can apply this concept to house plants in other seasons. Just describe what you're trying to accomplish to the folks at your local garden center, and I think you'll be amazed at the assortment of house plants out there suitable for an arrangement like this. We've all seen the beautiful autumn display outdoors, but how about a way to extend our enjoyment of these fall colors indoors? You can do this simply by combining a couple of easy to care for house plants in an arrangement. The two I've chosen bring the best of foliage and bloom together and keep maintenance at a minimum. I have this croton for its incredibly vibrant foliage and this calancho for its long lasting delicate flowers. Now whenever I combine plants in an arrangement, I always try to choose those that require similar growing conditions. Both of these need at least four hours of direct sunlight or 12 hours of artificial light a day. And when it comes to watering, just try to keep the soil moist. When arranging these, I like to keep it simple. I begin by lining a basket with a garbage bag. This keeps me from making a mess when I water. And then I simply put the croton toward the back and place the calanchos toward the front. This usually just takes about three plants. But I usually keep a smaller one on standby just in case I need to fill in a hole like this. See how nicely the color of the flower complements the colors in the leaf of the croton. As a finishing touch, I'm accenting the arrangement with some winter squash and gourds. The great thing about this is that it only takes a few minutes to put together and it'll last for four to five weeks or more. <laughs> I hope you've picked up some ideas in today's show that help you blur the lines between inside and out. You know one of the best ways to enjoy the garden home is to bring a touch of nature inside. Until next time, from the garden home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home, We'll take a look at some of the newest plant varieties for our garden homes. Plants such as coleus, verbena, gazania, and foxglove. And we'll also find out about some new changes to fall classics, which make them ideal inside-out plants. 
I'll also share with you some design tips that'll inspire you to bring outdoor plants inside.